Hi, I'm Mark van Dijk, one of the lecturers for Tax 3702, and I'm going to be working through question one of your assignment three. It's a previous exam paper. And question one was the biggest question in this exam, and let's take a look at it. So the starting point is we go and look at the required. Why do we look at the required? Because we want to know what is the destination, what is the goal for this question. When we read through it, we want to know where do we end up in this question. So let's take a look at the required. Calculate Kasim's net tax liability for the year of assessment ended 28 February 2014 for 35 marks. And it's a 42-minute question. Always bear in mind the amount of time that the question is going to take. That's very important. And work under time constraints. So we know that the question, the required says net tax liability. I would recommend that you take a highlighter into the exam and highlight the required so you, you don't forget what the destination is. Net tax liability. It's not taxable income. It's not normal tax. It's net tax liability right at the end of the tax framework. Right, so we know what the required is. Let's go and take a look at, <clears throat> start reading through the question at the top. Kasim, 41 years old. Again, I'd haul out my, my highlighter and highlight the age. Obviously, his age is important for rebates, for exemptions, for the medical deduction. That's going to be important. He works for an IT company. He's married out of community of property. So that simplifies our life. We don't have to split his investment income between him and his spouse. He's out of, married out of community of property, and he has three children. That's probably going to be important if he has a medical expense. So there we've highlighted the three important issues in the opening paragraph, and here are the details of his income and expenses for the 2014 year of assessment. And now I would recommend when you start working through the exam paper, you just start working line item by line item through the information. Don't read the whole thing and then go back. Just start at the top and start your calculation. And the destination is net tax liability. Right, so let's, the clock is ticking, let's start. What's the first item? Salary. Well, there's nothing to think about there. That's going to be taxable. And notice I used two columns. I'd recommend that you do that in your, in your answer. The amounts that are fully taxable go into the right-hand column. Obviously, a salary, there's no issue. It's taxable. All amounts that are fully tax deductible go into the right-hand column. All your other calculations go into the inner column. Or if you, you might need this inner area for things like travel allowance, or use of company car, but always use two columns. So that's the salary sorted out. Now we get to something, purchase annuity, and it's our first note. And we see, let's just write it in, purchase annuity of 30,000 Rand. And there's going to be a calculation involved here, so notice I put it on the inner column. And let's go and look at the note. It states that he purchased an annuity in February 2013, paid a capital payment of 250,000, his life expectancy is given, and he receives two and a half, an annuity of 2,500 Rand per month for the entire year of assessment, amounting to 30,000 Rand for the full year of assessment. Now, it's important to understand the principles involved with the purchase annuity. What has he done? He's taken 250,000. He's gone to a financial institution, handed over the 250,000 rand to the financial institution. They've invested the money on his behalf, and in terms of the contract, they are going to start paying him a monthly annuity in return. Now, those annuities are partially a capital repayment of his original 250,000 Rand investment. It's a repayment of his capital investment plus the fruit of his investment, the investment returns. 
So that 2,500 rand every month that he gets back is partially capital and partially revenue, and you need to work out the capital portion. Once you've got it, you can work out the taxable portion. And what do you need for that? Obviously, for working through this, you must have your tutorial letter 101 and 201 in front of you. So we need a formula. Y equals A divided by B times C. And Y is the capital portion of the 30,000. So what is A? That's his capital investment, 250,000. Divided by B, which is his total investment returns over the entire course of the contract. And we know that he receives 2,500 rand per month, so you multiply by 12, times, and we're told that his life expectancy, we don't know how long he's going to live, so we've got to look at life expectancy tables. What is, what is his probable life expectancy? And it is, we're told, it's 29,54 years. Multiply that amount by C, which is the amount of retirement annuities he received during the current year of assessment. And that answer gives you an amount of 8463. What does this 8463 represent? It's the capital portion of these, th these 30,000 rand in annuities that he received. That portion is not taxable. They're simply paying him back what he paid to the financial institution. That is capital. The balance of 21,537 is taxable. Simple. So that's the purchase annuity sorted out. So purchase annuity is done. Let's put a red line through it and move on to the, the next note, which is number two, a bursary. And we're told that he's granted a bursary. Let's just write it in. We've got to deal with it. He receives a bursary of, how much was it? 70,000 rand. The bursary from his employer, and the bursary includes tuition fees, etc. And this is important. Kasim agrees to repay the bursary should he not complete his studies. Now the question is this bursary, 70,000 rand, is it taxable or isn't it? And it's not taxable because he as the employee has agreed to repay the bursary should he not complete his studies. So in that case, it is not tax, it's fully exempt, so you can just put a null in the right-hand column. The bursary is not taxable because he'll repay it if he doesn't complete his studies. Right, so that's the bursary. Now we move on to probably the biggest note in the question, the travel allowance. So let's just write that in. And we're told that he receives a travel allowance for 10 months of the year, how much? 7,500 a month and so in other words, it's 75,000 rand. What's the principle involved with the travel allowance? It's one of the allowances that you can reduce um, by business travel expenditure. And that's what we're going to have to work out. How do you work that out? By multiplying business kilometers traveled by cost per, cost per kilometer. Those two amounts. So how do we work them out? The first part we're told he used his private vehicle from 1 May 2013. That's going to be important. It wasn't for the full year of assessment. It was only for 10 months. He purchased it for 520,000, that inclusive. He kept a logbook, and that tells us what his distance is, his distance, the distance that he traveled. So let's, let's work out his business kilometers traveled. That's the first part. Total KMs traveled amounted to 17,500 KM. Notice I work on the inner area here now. We're given his private. You're going to have to excuse my handwriting. It's not that neat. 
but you've got the solution in front of you. We told that 6,100 km were for private purposes. So in other words, it's very simple. 11,400 km were for business purposes, travel. So that's one half of the calculation done. Now we've got to work out cost per kilometer. And there are two options. What does this question say? He kept an, <clears throat> an accurate record of his vehicle's expenses. That's important because that means you're going to work out deemed cost per kilometer and actual. Why? Because he kept accurate records. Right, so let's start with the deemed cost per kilometer. Fixed cost, we know his vehicle. You go to the, you'll go to the, tax, the, the tables at the back of your exam paper to look this up. His vehicle costs 520,000. You'll know that for vehicles 480,000 rand or more, the fixed cost is 118078. That you divide by total kilometers traveled, not business kilometers, total kilometers. Divide by 17,500 km, and this is a step that a lot of students will miss out, is you've got to apportion for the part of the year that he received it, if he received it for part of the year. And he received it for 304 days out of 365. So in other words, his fixed cost per kilometer was 5.62 cents. You could have used 10 divided by 12 in an exam situation, that's also acceptable. Although, strictly speaking, you should use days. So that's fixed cost. You also go to the table, look up fuel cost per kilometer in the DEEM tables. <coughs> that's 147,7. Maintenance. Maintenance is 70,5. Getting you to deem cost per kilometer of 780,2 cents. In other words, 7 rand 80,02. Uh, so that's the first step. Then actual costs per kilometer. Sorry, let's just get that back into the screen. Per km. And what are we told? We're told that his running costs amounted to 12,800. So there's nothing to work out there. You just include that. And his finance charges for the 10-month period based on a loan of 500,000 amounted to 56,800. Now, what you need to know for the travel allowance is, is that the maximum value for a vehicle is 480,000. So if you have a vehicle that costs more than that, the amount that you can use is 480,000. So if your loan, in this case, is 500,000, you can, you can include finance charges in your actual costs, but you've got to apportion them as if the loan was 480,000, not 500,000. How do you do that? You simply multiply 56,800 by, let's just this here, finance charges. You multiply 480,000 or divide 480,000 by 500,000 times the finance charges that he paid, 56,800. And that gives you an amount of rand 54,528. In other words, 54,528 is the amount of finance charges he would have paid on a loan of 480,000. Then there's one extra actual cost that you're not going to be given in the, the question paper that you need to know is that you can include depreciation worked out over seven years. So depreciation, try and put this all on one page. Depreciation, once again, limited to a maximum of 480,000. 
that you must know, maximum amount 480,000, divide by seven and multiply by the portion of the year that he received the allowance. 304 divided by 365 gives you 57,112. Once again, multiplying by 10 divided by 12 would have been acceptable as well. And that gets you to total actual costs of 124,440. So you've got total actual costs of 124,440, so, and you want to work out actual cost per kilometer. You, you know what the deemed cost is? It's 780,2. What is the actual cost per kilometer? So unfortunately, I'm going to have to go onto another page. Let's just keep that to one side. <coughs> and to work out actual cost per kilometer, let's just bring this down so we can see it in the screen. Right. <coughs> it is 124,440 divided by total kilometers traveled. Not business kilometers, total kilometers. And that will give you actual cost per kilometer of 7 rand, comma, 1, 1. You compare it to your deemed cost per kilometer of 780,2, and you choose the higher. Obviously, deemed is higher. So in order to work out your business travel expenses, you multiply your business kilometers traveled, 11,400 km, times deemed cost per kilometer because it's a higher amount, 7,802, and that gets you to an amount of 8,8. This, this, these are your business travel expenses, 88,943. Let's just put the travel allowance back in here of 75,000. So travel allowance, 75,000. Business expenses of 88,943. In other words, your entire your entire travel allowance is not going to be taxable. Just don't make the mistake of putting a negative amount here. You can never get a deduction for an allowance. It's either taxable, partially taxable, or tax-free, but you can't get a deduction here. So the travel allowance is not taxable. So that's a t the travel allowance sorted out. Let's just put a line through it. That's now done. And now we move on to the next note, which is the subsistence allowance, note four. Let me just start writing that in. He went away on business for six nights, and he received a travel allowance from, sorry, a subsistence allowance from his employer. And what does the question say? Six nights away, received an allowance of 350 rand per day to cover his meals and incidental costs. And he kept proof of his expenses, and various three expenses are given to you. Each of them qualify as meals and incidental costs. There are meals, parking, and laundry. All of those are legitimate meals or incidental costs. So he could potentially claim them as deductions. Remember, subsistence allowance is another allowance, like the travel allowance, where you can reduce the amount received for business-related expenditure, one of the few allowances. Okay, so what did he receive? Let's just take a look. 350 rand per day. That amounts to, for six days, 2,100 rand. 2,100, and this, it's a similar principle to the travel allowance. What were his actual costs, and what are, the, what are the deemed costs? And you choose the higher amount. So his actual costs actual costs amount to 1,930. We're not putting them into the right hand, this inner column yet. We want to choose the higher of actual or deemed. And what are the deemed costs? Now, the deemed amounts you need to know going into the exam. You need to memorize them. There's a deemed amount for meals and incidental costs, and there's a deemed amount for incidental costs on their own. But in this case, he received a subsistence allowance for meals and incidental costs. 
And the deemed amount for meals and incidental costs amounts to 319 rand per day. And that amounts to, for six days, 1,914 rand. You look at the actual, look at the deemed, and choose the higher amount. Obviously, actual is higher. And that's the amount you can deduct. So in other words, 170 rand of the subsistence allowance is going to be taxable. So that's a subsistence allowance sorted out. Simple, straightforward, move on. Note four, done. Let's just take a look at the question itself. Is there any, anything without notes? Yes, there are. We've dealt with salary, purchase annuity, bursary travel allowance, subsistence allowance. Foreign interest, there is no note of 5,500. This is nice and straightforward. Foreign interest, fully taxable, end of story. No exemptions, fully taxable to go straight into the right-hand column. Unlike foreign dividends where there is an exemption, but this is foreign interest, fully taxable. You've got your one mark, move on. What's the next item? South African interest. And just one little note. This is a calculation-based question. So you don't need to give me long explanations if, if an amount is exempt. Just write exempt, put a null or whatever, and move on. You don't need, it's not a discussion question, it's a calculation question. So keep it brief, keep your, your calculation concise and brief. He receives South African interest of 27,200. He's 41 years old, so we know that his interest exemption is 23,800 for taxpayers under 65. So the taxable portion of his local interest is 3,400. Nice and simple, you've got your one mark there. Those are all the interest, sorry, the income amounts now sorted out. Just be careful before you start moving on to the deductions, always check with the medical expenditure, is there a fringe benefit there? Let's just go and look at the notes. For note five, <coughs> just briefly scan it to see if there's a, a medical fringe benefit. We don't have to get into the details. But it says Kasim is responsible for paying 40% of these contributions. His employer pays the balance of 60%. So there we know there's a fringe benefit. So they pay 60% of 20, 27,600. So there is a fringe benefit. Let's just quickly calculate that. Medical fringe benefit, let me just put that into the screen. And that is the calculation is 27,600. We know his employer. What is the fringe benefit? It's just what the employer pays. It's that simple. And we're told they, play, they pay 60% of the contributions. So simple, 16,560. And that gets you to your medical fringe benefit. We add up all our amounts and we get to a subtotal of 667,167. Right? Now we're going to look at the deductions. And let's go back to the first page of the question. There are the expenses, medical expen expenditure and contributions to an RAF. We know that medical expenditure always comes last for a taxable income question. So you must deal with the RAF first. So let's work that out. Less RAF, and we see that actual contributions, let's just move this up, actual contributions amount to 72,000. And we want to know how much of this can he claim for tax purposes. And there are three limits, as you know, for retirement annuity fund contribution deduction. You can choose the greatest of those three. Always list the three, see what the three are, and choose the greatest. So what are they? 
rand 1750 or three and a half thousand rand minus any pension fund contribution deduction. There were none, so it's n ignored. In other words, three and a half thousand is the second limitation or 15% times non-retirement funding income. In other words, of the subtotal, how much of it is non-retirement funding income? Now, a lot of students made the mistake of taking the salary out of the subtotal. And normally that's correct if the taxpayer contributes to a pension fund. But this taxpayer does not contribute to a pension fund. So by definition, this entire amount is non-retirement funding income. So it is very simple. All you had to do was multiply 15 this amount by 15%. 667, 167 gives you an amount of 100,075 rand. Obviously, this is the greater amount. What did he actually contribute? In other words, you can deduct, you can deduct for tax purposes his full contributions. Just bear in mind, that's the limitation, the 100,075. You can never deduct more than, than the taxpayer actually contributed. So that's the upper limit. So the full 72,000 is deductible. And our new subtotal is 595,167. Right, let's move on to the very last deduction, which is the medical deduction. Once again, I'm using <coughs> two columns. I recommend you always do that. <coughs> and let's take a look. Let's just bring forward our subtotal of 595167. And now we're getting to the medical deduction. The final deduction in a taxable income calculation. Let's go and take a look at the notes. Let's get into the detail here. He's a member of Medical Aid Fund. His wife and three children are all dependents and none of them have a disability as defined. That's important. And we told how much he contributes and there are various expenses that the Medical Aid didn't pay. Physiotherapist, optometrist. Those expenses are qualifying expenses. They are legitimate exp qualifying expenses. If they had been, for example, non-prescription medicines, you couldn't, they would not be qualifying expenses. But these two amounts do qualify, so bear that in mind. So we know this taxpayer is under 65 and no member of the family has a disability. So that's going to affect the calculation. So what's the starting point for a taxpayer under 65, and no member of the family has a disability. It's simple. We start with the medical aid contributions. What did he contribute? Let me just get my black pen. <coughs> Employees' contributions. Once again, no, no explanations. Just write it down. He contributed... 40%, which is 11.040. What is the employer's contributions? And that should tie up to the fringe benefit that you included higher up in your calculation, which was 16.560. Right? And that gets you to a total of 27.600. So that's your starting point. Add up the employer's contributions, in other words, the fringe benefit, plus the employee's contributions, and you get to a total. Now, what you want to see is how much of that total ex exceeds four times the annual medical scheme fees tax credit. So we've got to work out the medical scheme fees tax credit. What is this taxpayer's? medical scheme fees tax credit. We know that he's married and he has three children and they're all dependents on his medical aid fund. 
So to work out the medical scheme fees tax credit, we, we know that for the first member, it's 242 per month, plus 242 for the first dependent, plus 162 for every dependent thereafter. So in other words, say for the three children. That gets you, and you've got to multiply all of that by 12. That gets you to an amount of an annual medical scheme fees tax credit of 11,640. Right? So we've got the annual amount, but you want to see how much of this 27,600 exceeds four times the annual amount. So you multiply 11,640 times four, and that gets us to 46,560. Does this exceed that? No. So there's no excess, so it's zero. Just don't make the mistake of putting a negative amount here. It either exceeds it or it doesn't. So no portion of the 27,600 exceeds four times the medical scheme fees tax credit, so that's zero. So now we've dealt with that part of the, we've dealt with the medical aid contributions, now we look at the qualifying medical expenses. <clears throat> and we've already added them up. They, they, all of them qualify their amount to 10,800. We add them to this amount, or in this case it's naught, but let's just go through the procedure. Add it to naught, so obviously that's 10,800. Now we have this, this total, 10,800. Just remember that if this taxpayer was disabled or had a family member who is disabled, you would take this 10,800, put it in the right-hand column, and that would be his medical deduction. But he's not disabled, and no, no family member is disabled. So there's one more step, one more hurdle that he's got to overcome to claim a medical deduction, and that is to see how much of this amount, in this example it's 10,800, how much of it exceeds 7.5% of taxable income? How much of it exceeds 7.5% of his taxable income? And his taxable income is 595,167, and that amounts to 44 Six three eight. Ten thousand eight hundred does not exceed forty four six three eight. So in other words, unfortunately, this taxpayer does not get a medical deduction. We'll see that he still gets a credit later on, but in terms of calculating his taxable income, he doesn't get a medical deduction. D once again, don't make the mistake of putting a negative amount here when this amount is greater than that amount. It's no. So what is his taxable income? 595,167. So there we've reached a big milestone in this calculation. We've reached taxable income. But we know from the required that he needs to calculate a net tax payable. So what is his normal tax on his taxable income? You'll go to the tax tables at the back of the exam paper, work it out. I'm not going to do that now just to save time. I know that it's 168,700. That's a simple calculation for one mark. What is his net normal tax? We can deduct a rebate. We know that he's, he's um, under 65 years, so he only gets the primary rebate, which is 12,000 and 80 rand. You can deduct that from his normal tax. And there's one more step which a lot of students miss, and it's worth one mark. Don't forget the medical scheme fees tax credit. And you've already worked it higher up. There it is. You've already done it. 11,640 11, in this case. <coughs> so that the medical credit, tax credit, is 11,640. 
He doesn't have any prepaid tax. There's no provisional tax or employees tax. So you don't need to take that into account. We've got his normal tax. We conducted the primary rebate. We deduct the medical tax credit, the annual amount, and that gets us to his net tax payable of 144,980 net tax payable. And that, very simply, is a solution to question one.